We call the September 24, 2019 work session meeting of the Portsmouth City Council to order. And uh, Madam City Clerk, do you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Battle. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Glover. Here. This is Lucas Burke. Here. Mr. Moody. Here. Ms. Simmons. Here. Mayor Rowe. Here. I'll ask everybody to continue to silence their phones. And if you feel the need that you need to talk, please go into the uh, lobby area. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Patton. Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. This evening, we have two presentations. The first, Chief Jim Hoffler of the Portsmouth Fire Rescue and Emergency Services will present the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Award from the Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency. This grant award is on the city manager's report this evening for your approval of the $630,000 appropriation to the FY 2020 Fire, Rescue, and Emergency Services Grant Fund. The second presentation, Mrs. Elaine Brathwaite, Behavioral Health Care Services Director, will discuss the impact of the nation's opioid crisis on the city of Portsmouth and the department's mission to link support and educate citizens seeking services. Chief Hoffler. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Mayor Rowe, members of council, and Dr. Patton. Uh, the assistance of firefighter grant is something we've been pursuing. Uh, we went after last year, we're unsuccessful. This year, our grant team put together a package and we were awarded a grant uh, to for safety equipment, which is our self-contained breathing apparatus. It's the tanks and harnesses you see you, the firefighters wear on their back to go into contaminated environments. Uh, along with that, also six firefighter rescue packs, which are the packs that our firefighter rescue teams can carry into a building where a firefighter may be trapped and provide breathing air for a trapped firefighter. And the last component of it was a breathing air compressors that we were looking for. Our original uh, uh, cost was close to a million dollars for this. Uh, uh, it's all market-based when it comes to the uh, FEMA and AFG grants. Uh, they gave us enough money to get what we need to get, uh, which is uh, means not a lot of beeps, buzzers, bells, and whistles, but we will have the, the modern, updated equipment that is within standard that, so our firefighters will be protected in these contaminated environments. Uh, <clears throat> our state and our officials in Washington, they have a lot to do with this and us the awarding of the money, the appropriating of the money. Uh, a lot of fire departments, including ours, uh, would really be short of this important safety equipment without their help. So uh, one of the things we always like to do is recognize the folks who made this possible, which is the, our uh, hardworking folks in Washington as well as our um, uh, people at FEMA. Uh, if we can back up a little to the slides, uh, one of the things that we're addressing with our self-contained breathing apparatus, our current apparatus that we have for our firefighters is almost three standards out from turning into unusable. Uh, it's a 2007 standard. Uh, when I became fire chief, one of the first things we looked at um, after you all so graciously provide all that equipment uh, for the EMS and for the turnout gear and all. Our next biggest thing that we knew was going to hurt us was our self-contained breathing apparatus. We had 2007 standard breathing apparatus on throughout our department. Uh, it gets checked every year, it gets certified. Our breathing air compressors, even though they're old, they do work. Uh, so we're not putting anybody at danger. The problem is this stuff does have a bit of a shelf life on it and it's all getting to the point now where it's uh, worn and it's becoming more and more of a problem to uh, keep it working. Uh, as you can see from uh, this, uh, this is Captain Dion Gauls at Station 10. He just came out of a burning building. You can see that that's some of the new turnout gear you all appropriated. Uh, he can go back to the station, throw that turnout gear and an extractor, put his clean set on. The harness that he's wearing is one of our old SCBAs, and that's down self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, that harness we had to take off and kind of take out really 
in the street and scrub with brushes and soap and all uh, because it's, it's an old model. When they, we bought this, you couldn't take them apart to wash them. The standards we're looking to do now to bring up to 2018 compliance is removable, uh, the padded straps and all can all go into the extractors with the turnout gear so it all gets washed, it all gets clean, it all gets decontaminated, which fits into our cancer initiatives that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> the new uh, self-contained breathing apparatus also has universal fittings that have, the fire service has tried to do this for a while and just get all the manufacturers to have all the fittings that are standard because when we go into a burning building, if it's big enough in another department, say the shipyard, who we run a lot of calls with, uh, Chesapeake, Suffolk, any of our neighbors, their fittings might not made up to ours. Now they, it's been standardized and our current fittings will move to this standard with this new breathing apparatus. Uh, getting a total of 89 sets of apparatus, which is the harness, the regulator, and the face pieces that you see uh, that go on the firefighter's face. Uh, one of the things with that, uh, those face pieces, the new standard is a very high temperature resistant face piece. They've had some firefighter deaths and serious injuries when face pieces failed because of the high heat. Uh, that and I uh, have to give Mr. Jones an IT a prop. He got us a high temperature radio cords that uh, these things used to fail and fuse together. You couldn't call for help. The other weak component with all this modern gear is that face piece. So we, uh, uh, to buy the new SCBAs, we would get these new face pieces. In our department, everybody has their own custom fitted face piece. So we're gonna have to come out of pocket for an additional about $40,000 to equip another 140 people with, uh, with uh, face pieces uh, to make sure it's all compliant. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. Our breathing air compressors. This one is 28 years old. Our other one that we want to replace, that we put in for the grant to be replaced, is uh, right at 20 years old. Uh, the standards, they're, they're kind of behind the times. Uh, there's issues with the uh, uh, explosion protection that uh, is on the older models. Uh, of course, anything that's old, the increasing maintenance that goes with it. These machines still, though, they get certified yearly, they get worked on frequently, and the, the air that comes out of them has to be sent off and monitored and certified. So we're not currently putting our people at risk, but we understand as time goes along, uh, we have three compressors, two of them right now are just about, one is definitely at the end of its life, the other one um, is very close behind us. So we look to do two compressors, we only got the money for one, but uh, we'll be replacing the 28-year-old one that is out at the Winchester Drive Station. Next, please. The grant itself, uh, there was a little over, we don't have 2019 statistics, but 2018 there was a little over 8,000 departments that put in for an AFT grant. It'll probably be that or more this year. Uh, in Virginia, four departments were awarded uh, money, and we topped it out at $630,000. Our total for what we were awarded with the market value that the AFG people, the people who read the grants and make estimates are, uh, you know, they dropped us down from the about million we wanted to the 630. And why that's done is they give you, they don't give you everything with the beeps, buzzers, whistles, like uh, the ones we kind of were looking at have Wi-Fi connection. They, you can scan things, all kinds of crazy things that are modern and different from what we do things now that are, are nice to have, but they're very expensive. And they also add problems to keep them fixed and repaired. Uh, so AFD comes along and says, well, this is what your firefighters need to go into burning buildings. That's what we're going to fund you. So along with uh, the, the dropping of the grant, we lost the second compressor, and we also uh, lost the, um, the additional 140 face pieces that uh, we're going to uh, probably buy those out of our budget. Uh, but it was nice, it's awesome to get $630,000. We had to match 10% of that, so we had to get $63,000 out of our budget <coughs> for a total of uh, $690,000 uh, to put towards this project. Next, please. Uh, this is a sample of one of the new air packs. This is a manufacturer we currently use. As you can see, the, what we're talking about coming off of this is all this stuff that would normally stay on and we would scrub with a brush 
and then let it air dry and put it back on the truck. Now we'll be able to put those things in the same extractors that our turnout gear goes in and it will completely decontaminate this because just the, the truth of the matter is that we take those, we scrub them best we can, we dry them out and we put them back in the trucks and then we're subject to go out in public and do a PR thing and you know we, we like to put kids up in the fire trucks and this is the last piece of our turnout gear, our clean cab uh, for the fire engines, our new turnout gear, this is the last component that we really can't clean up and make those cabs completely contaminant free. But uh, this will go a long way in uh, getting us there. The second is the uh, breathing air compressor, uh, about $70,000 for one of those. Uh, this one uh, has all the modern uh, recording things that we need to keep track of of uh, what we're doing, what's filled, when it's filled, etc. It has the modern explosion proof uh, uh, doors and cylinders that are an upgrade from the old ones. And it's new, latest, greatest thing that's on the market. And uh, uh, with our public safety folks out there, especially our firefighters who depend on these things, this is something that we really take seriously is monitoring their breathing air, of course. Uh, giving them the best that we can give them. Uh, it's time to get rid of the old ones. We know that. Uh, we've been planning for over two years, uh, knowing that this was coming uh, in about less than a year. Our current ones will not be usable anymore. So by that time, uh, we hope to be awarded the grant, which we were. We'll get these new ones in and be okay uh, with our upgraded self-contained breathing apparatus. And it's not a fire chief in the nation to tell you he don't want upgraded breathing apparatus for his people. This is a, a very big win for ourselves and our citizens and mainly uh, our firefighters. Uh, the, the same thing with the breathing air compressor. Uh, one thing with the old apparatus, uh, they're still usable. They're still, uh, they still can be used and we're looking at trying to sell that and return some money to the general fund for uh, the about 140 sets of this old gear that we have out there. But the new gear will come with new bottle, air bo bottles for the back, as well as the harnesses, regulators, and the face pieces for firefighters to wear. Next. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Dr. Pat. Yes, Pat. Mayor, um, as uh, the chief indicated, through the grant, they will um, replace one compressor. One of our compressors is about 10 years old, which is in good shape. We're going to find the money to purchase the other compressor. So all of our compressors will be in, in standard. And up to date. Oh, that's outstanding. Yeah. Where does the, is there one compressor for everybody, or is there one at every station, or is it on the truck? Or no, ma'am. We have one at station uh, one on FEM Street, one at station seven in the middle of the city, and a smaller one, the newer one, is at the Churchland Fire Station on River Shore Road. So we have three total that, uh, that keeps our people that go back to stations or a close station to where they're stationed at and keeps them from going out of service and riding all over the city. We used to have it all downtown. Everybody had to come downtown after fire and fill their bottles. So if you're in Churchland, a fire happens in Churchland when you're downtown, you know. Uh, so we took on that project a while back and were able, uh, um, a couple fire chiefs to go to get the additional compressors in uh, those additional stations. So we have three total. One's really had it, the other one's on the way being had, the one church that's doing okay, it's only about 10 years old or so. Bill? Who, uh, who wrote the grant? The grant is written by a group of people, and I'll let um, um, Mr. And, uh, and the Chief. reason why I ask, I, I, I think uh, uh, we owe him uh, uh, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, we have you. the grants officer that works with all of the departments. Right. Then those departments come together with their key people who can contribute to be, writing it and right. he will be nice to recognize right. them by yeah. name we we have and i have to say this is in my 40 years in the city the continuity between departments the cooperation between departments whether it's finance hr the city manager's office is unlike anything i've seen and i uh, give a lot of that to dr patton and she demands that of us which i'm fine with and uh, it makes it a lot easier to do these things we have uh, our grant right team regina humphrey uh, Deputy Chief Nestor Mangubat, Battalion Chief Chris Riley, and Battalion Chief Justin Arnold. That, they're the people who wrote the grant. They, they deserve the credit, but also everybody else who has a hand in this does. And uh, um, we were fortunate, over the years, uh, Chief Riley and Chief Arnold have been on the AFG grant committee to go write the grant, so they were dialed in to how to really 
get the most bang out of it, how to justify things, and, mm -hmm. and it really worked for us this time. So, Vice Mayor. Yeah, uh, yes, with the, the compressors and the scuba, I call them scuba, <laughs> scuba <laughs> units. <laughs> um, how long does it take to fill, and how often does it have to be filled, and how much heavier is this new one? It looks a lot bigger <coughs> than the old one. Was look, little it's thing. actually lighter than our current it ones. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and to fill it, if it's completely empty, uh, it can take up to five, six minutes to fill a single bottom. Most of the time, they're not completely empty. They usually go down from about uh, 4,000, 4,500 PSI, and they'll get them down to about 2,000 or so, and then they'll go top them off. So it really doesn't take that much time. The technology is a lot better than it was back in the day when we had to use Cascade bottles yeah. and dip the things in water to keep them cool. <laughs> uh, now these machines do all that for us. And do they have some kind of alert to let them know, or they just know when to fill them? Uh, you set it, you can set the compressor uh, to put how much air you want in it. Uh, and the, the machines are set, uh, the newer ones that are out there have some 5,000 PSI uh, bottles. Ours are 4,500, so our machine would top off at 4,500, you know, and that's as high as it would go, so it wouldn't overpressurize uh, any of the bottles. Mayor, uh, members of council, I would like to um, say to you uh, again and thank you. There are not many fire departments in the United States with turnout gear. Mm -hmm. And your approval for this to be really one of the first in the Commonwealth to have two sets of gear, mm -hmm. we have um, replaced our um, I call them washing machines, but they're not washing machines, mm -hmm. but the machines to clean the gear, mm -hmm. upgrading that, and now 8,000 applications for this grant, and the city of Portsmouth received in this award more than anyone else in the Commonwealth is very significant uh, to the work, the support, and the interest that this team has in achieving excellence in what they do. Mm -hmm. Very fortunate, and I'd like again to thank y'all for your support. We couldn't do it without you. Everything we've been getting, um, our bottom line is safety for the citizens, and of course safety for our people. And y'all really focus on that. And as a fire chief, I am eternally grateful for that. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yes, sir. Um, I'm from Portsmouth. Yes, sir. And um, so I know things that has happened from decade to decade, and. Um, I know a lot of people here, and they said when you were two years old, you wanted to be a fireman. Probably before that, Mr. Battle. And, <laughs> and they said you played with your trucks till you were 15. I'm still playing with the trucks, Mr. Battle. <laughs> <laughs> bigger trucks. <laughs> a lot bigger trucks, a lot more expensive. Thank you for those six trucks, by the way. It's <laughs> so another thing. They said your knowledge yeah. is impeccable. Mm -hmm. They said you're the only person that has ever been down there that can go into any machine, any situation, and operate as it's, you're supposed to. And I just wanted to congratulate you and thank you for sharing well, thank you. your professionalism. I'll have to give credit to a couple of folks that are sitting here in the room. Um, Lieutenant, at the time, retired as a deputy chief. Grover Hallman was my lieutenant on a, a ladder company. He was one of the people who showed me the right way to do things. Carl Alexander, another guy, wouldn't let us do it the wrong way. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And so we're trying to pass that on to our new firefighters. This is Portsmouth. This is how we do it. We're not going to do it any other way. Very fortunate. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Dion owes cake and ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is breath away. Let's go to that. Excellent. Yes. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and guests. I'm here tonight to talk about the opiate crisis. I don't think there's anyone that is not aware of the impact that opiate has had upon all our people. One of the things uh, I want to do is talk about the statistics and the data to let you know why this is a crisis. I want to talk about the funding that we get from the state and the federal government. And I also want to talk about what we're doing with that funding, what activities that we put on, what interventions we put in place to deal with those risk factors. And then I want to just tell you, 
there's still hope. Like I said, I think the best way to make it clear about what the impact the opiate has on people is to talk about the statistics and the data. As you can see, 280,000 people have died from overdose in the past years. 64,000 die per year. 115 Americans die from an overdose a day. Now, from the data that I gathered, and I was really surprised myself when I found this out, there are three states that had a tremendous increase in deaths due to the opiate epidemic. Virginia has the largest increase of 21%. I want to say that again. Virginia has the largest increase in America. I mean, I was really startled when I saw that information myself. Now, for Portsmouth, we have a methadone clinic. In the last nine, ye nine months, our increase of people coming in to get on our methadone program has increased by almost 40%. And that is due to the Medicaid expansion because now, this is the first time this has been able to happen, is that people now can um, pay for methadone with Medicaid. That never was before, so that's why we have that increase. The opiate uh, crisis has impacted us in many other ways, too. Suicide. Can you think about someone who's out there using drugs, stealing from their parents, their body is messed up, they've lost weight, they're not clean, they could be homeless. All these factors are going on. Um, the family, eventually the family won't even let them in the house, they have nowhere to go, they don't have jobs, they don't have ways, they're out there still and trying to get these drugs because they're totally addicted. So a lot of people commit suicide. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. 129 suicides per day in America. One person die every seven hours in Virginia. Another risk factors that happen uh, and can be uh, tr traced down to the opiate epidemic is HIV AIDS. People are out there, they will get those drugs by any way they can. They need a needle, they will share the needle. They don't care at the time. They can even know that the person has AIDS or HIV. And they still will use that person's needle, just hoping it won't happen to them. There are over a million people in the United States that are living with HIV AIDS today. I mean, that is critical mm -hmm. and is alarming. Now, you know for yourself that in Portsmouth we have 100,000 people, less than, just a little less than 100,000. Virginia Beach has over 450,000 citizens. Our numbers in Virginia Beach are up there as some of the two highest in the state. And can you imagine with us having less than 100,000 people, the people that are diagnosed with HIVs every year? So you can see that with the statistics that I provided for you all in the last few years. Now, the, like I said, you don't go a day without seeing an opiate crisis. Epidemic is all over the news, the newspaper. So the feds had to do something about it and the state had to do something about it. So they have come up with all this funding to give to areas and state. The state is to give it out to various uh, agencies. For ours, it's Community mm -hmm. Services Board, which is what our Department of Behavioral Health Care Services is under. Now, we have two sources of funding, the Virginia Opiate Treatment Response and the State Opiate Response. As you can see, those are the funding they've given us at different intervals throughout the year. The way we get that money is, uh, one, they know we have a high rate of overdose in Portsmouth. We have to also submit a proposal and tell them what we're going to do with that money. And then we have to show them the outcomes of that money. They won't just let you continue to get money if they can't see what you're doing. So a lot of our money is, uh, we'll tell them, we need, of, of course, what, what's going on, we need more clinical therapists, we need nurses, we need to increase our doctor's hours, 
We need to uh, help people who are on methadone so that they can find jobs, uh, can find homes, um, can get themselves together. We try to bring families back together. So we include those kind of activities in what we do. And one of the things that we were one of the first in our region to do is we were able to go into Maryview. There's everybody uh, in our region was trying to get into hospitals. So we were the first one in the region and maybe even the state, but I know for sure it's the region. And so we're one of the first in the state, if not the first, that we're able to get into hospitals. So when they know there's an overdose, they call what we call a peer specialist. And a peer, a peer specialist is a person who has been addicted and is in recovery. They can talk to people that have overdosed, uh, you know, when you're out there and you're in the hospital and you're an OD, you're scared to talk to uh, the police, you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't want them to know how much drugs you had or what drugs you took. But when you talk to a peer, you feel more comfortable because you know they're not judging you. They've been through it themselves, and so there's no judgment there. And so they will tell them things that you won't get from other people, but things that we need to know. When you're trying to help somebody through their addiction, the doctors need to know what's going on, how long you've been doing it, and what are you using? And so peers go, they'll call our peers at one and two o'clock in the morning, and our peers come. We, they know we will come, and that's the reason why we were so successful, because they know we respond, and they can call us any time. And so that is the reason why we were able to get into uh, the hospital. So we do, um, we have what we call a warm line. They can call us at any time. Any, Anyone on addiction that's trying to get in recovery can call these peers also, and they will uh, respond and talk to them and try to get them resources and help them with their addiction. So again, some of the things that we've done, we've had summits and awareness, that's the thing they want us to do. The, we have HIV testing days, uh, we test, we educate. We, uh, we have what is called the lock and talk training. We will train people and let them know. Um, one of the things is that people don't seem to know a lot of times is your children going into the medicine cabinet. So we're telling you lock up your medicine. And it is so many children today that are out there on drugs and they're getting them right in the cabinet in their homes. And so we give out uh, lock boxes that uh, combinations we be on it so you can lock up your medication. We talk to you about what's going on and make sure that everybody's alert to what's going on if they didn't know that that's what's happening. You might think, well, did I take that medication today or what? But it may be your child is taking that medication. And so these are the kind of things that we're doing. We got money to buy Narcon so that if a person overdose, uh, they, someone can get them uh, some Narcon and bring them back alive. One of the things that has helped us is with the fire department and the police department have been traveling. They've been doing it for years with Narcon on there. So even though we have a high rate of overdose and death, it's a lot of them have been saved because the fire department and the police department was there to save those lives and bring them back. So we are fortunate to be able to have people who are trained on that. I just found out myself when the chief told me they've been doing it ever since 1975. So they've saved a lot of lives in that time frame. We uh, also, like I said, we've been uh, doing a lot of activities with children and families, and here's some other additional things. The National Overdose Awareness, uh, Shatter the Silence was something we did with suicide. We have what we call revive training, which is to teach you how to use the uh, Narcon. You have to have the training first. We don't just give people the uh, Narcon. We have trainings, and the last three trainings we had, we was over booked and we had to uh, set up some additional training. So people are getting interested in that. They know there's a need for it. And so we're really proud of the fact that we're getting the word out there, increasing awareness, uh, doing activities, being in the community, putting posters up, putting flyers up. We're constantly out there. We want to be visible so people can see us. Again, a lot of the activities we've done, the same thing. We're trying to not just reach adults, but the whole family. And, and uh, so our approach is definitely having an impact and we can see a difference in that as far as the activities that we put on. Now we have additional funding uh, that starts in uh, October that they're giving us. Now I wanna say that 
some of the reason we continuously have gotten money is when I tell Dr. Patton that I need to be at this meeting so I can be at the table to get that money, she has never refused me. She's constantly said, uh, Miss Brethway, you need to be there to get some money, you need to be there. Mm -hmm. And that is what I do. If we, I, I wasn't at certain tables, we wouldn't have the money we have. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't there to hear the language that I may need to put in my proposal to get that money, or to, they can say, oh, because some of the times, I'm going to be honest with you, some of the times I'm the only executive director that is there. Mm -hmm. out, of, out of 40 CSBs, I'm sometimes the only one there. Mm -hmm. And I, when I'm sitting at that table, they see it and they know, and make sure they know who I am. And they are, they'll say, well, they know I'm interested. Portsmouth is a city that is there and is committed, and I get our money. Mm -hmm. We get more money than a lot of cities because of that, because we know that we care and we're serious about making a difference. So those are additional funding, and 175 is pending. I hope we get that, but that's what's coming in just in October. So as you see, we're, we're really doing a lot of things. We have uh, programs in the Hampton Roads Regional Jail. We're doing discharging, uh, planning with them. When someone is ready to get out, we try to set them up to come right straight to our program. We want to get into some programs in the city jail. As I said, we collaborate with Maryview. They brag about what we do with them. Uh, I've talked to the chief, uh, and we have uh, started, well, we will be starting, we're putting it together now. Uh, we will be traveling with his EMT uh, people, so when people overdose and they're in the homes, we go, we're going to have our peers go right to the home. So we'll be in the homes, we'll be in the community, we're going to be in the hospital. Uh, like I said, we're doing all kind of clinical uh, activities and training and our peer services and uh, purchasing Narcan. All these activities are things that we, what makes and puts us on the uh, map and people and making an impact. These are our interventions that we're trying to do now to make a difference. Now, one of the things I think is has to be clear is, it's one thing to talk about statistics and data, but when you see somebody's face, I've been doing, working with substance abuse for over 30 years. I cannot tell you the stories that I have seen and heard. And so when you see people sticking needles in their neck and all the veins in their body has collapsed because they got to go to the neck to put a needle in to put that heroin in there. Now, can you imagine that kind of uh, need? And and because you know that you could die from that, but you're gonna take that risk. When you see people dying, and it impacts the family, it affects your children. You see uh, people who sell their children and their babies to get a fix. This is serious, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we're out there to make a difference. And I wish I had time to talk to each and every one of you so you could understand how serious this is and how we need to work together to make an impact. Because it tears me, after 30 some years, to know and see what I've seen. People need help, mm -hmm. and they need us there. And I'm just glad that we are there to do what we can and we're getting some of the money that we need to combat those risk factors. So the opiate epidemic, the suicide and HIV AIDS are serious in this city. Not just America, mm -hmm. but you can't say it's not here. It is here, and data shows it. But there is hope. Miss um, Brethwaite, from, 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 from listening to you talk about being at the table and being at these meetings and that having a, an important impact on, on, on what you may receive. What can we do as policymakers um, and as leaders on, on council, based on what you hear from the different places you go, what are other councils doing to assist in these types of efforts beyond what, 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 what we do now, but, but just trying to understand what more could we do to help facilitate are you all success? I think that the fact that I am there, they know there's, there's like I said, there's 40 CSBs in the state. Some of them are standalone, which means they're separate. They're not a city department. Sure. They know that Portsmouth is a city department. And when I'm there and I'm speaking, I'm feeling like I have y'all's support. 
And I think that's what makes a difference because other boards do not have that support. Because people say, well, is there a advantage of being under the city? Because they can do some things that I can't do, okay? Sure. But I do a whole lot of things that they can't do. I have Mr. Ashby there for me when I need somebody to give me uh, you know, support and advice. They got to go hire a lawyer. Right. You know, uh, I have, I have it. If I need you guys, I know you're there because that comes through through the city manager. And so when I have, when I tell people, I know I have your support uh, because I am there. If I wasn't there, they would know I wouldn't. So because I've had everybody uh, support and and uh, like I said, Dr. Patton makes make sure. All I got to do is ask. Uh, and it has not been any problems. <clears throat> well, you do have, but did mm -hmm. I see your hand go yeah. first for yeah. Bill and then Paul? You know, Ms. Brethwaite, thanks for the uh, presentation. You know, an important element is to have someone heading up the program that cares. And it's quite obvious from your presentation that you're that person. And uh, thank you for the job that you do. <clears throat> thank you. Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Brethwaite, first of all, I'm on the board with the Community Service Board. And Ms. Brethwaite has worked all over that department in the last 30 years. Um, she's helped to initiate new programs, and she's always been kind of uh, low-keyed and, mm -hmm. and subtle within herself, and she won't tell you uh, or anything that seems braggadocious, she'll stay away True. from it. Mm -hmm. But the reason why she gets the money is she has what is called a three-year license. Mm -hmm. That's when the state says, oh, no, you are the best. Mm -hmm. We don't have to come and watch behind you. Mm -hmm. We don't have to treat you like a child because you exhibit adult tendencies at all times. And when you get that three-year license, you ought to catch me out. And when you apply for those grants, and they look and say three-year license, mm -hmm. you're going to get anything you want. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Patton, you've done a wonderful Thank job. You, you hired yeah. some you very took it out of my wonderful mouth. That's people. Awesome. Yeah, the car certification. And mm -hmm. we can't say thank you enough for bringing your experience and your application to our city. If, thank Wonderful you. job. Thank you. Here, I could piggyback just a second. Um, I was going to share with the council that Mrs. Brethwaite is one of the recognized, not only in the state of Virginia, but across the United States mm -hmm. right. as uh, cough, cough uh, advisors. So there are so many times during the year with her certifications that she has nationally that she will go to other major cities in the United States to sit and review their behavioral health care mm -hmm. so that they could get or not get the certification. But Portsmouth has been a certified behavioral health care center all the years I have been here mm -hmm. and um, all of her years. And it, it, I agree, Mr. Battle, it, I attribute it to the leadership. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Ms. Brethwaite, mm -hmm. for your work. Thank you all. Right. I did obvious. have a package for y'all, so I want y'all to oh, look yeah. at my little still package. Have, we yeah. still have questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you were good even when you had deplorable working conditions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you got that. <laughs> and you excel dis despite the conditions. And uh, yeah. I think it's clear that you have our support mm -hmm. and yes. our appreciation for being excellent. I do have a question, um, and it may be a question for the police, but is Narcon becoming a commodity that's sold on the street? Yeah. That's sold on the street? Yeah. I have not heard that. I wouldn't, I'm not surprised at anything. But uh, right now, the, um, the health department could give it out also. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, now we're giving it out. You just need to do, and, and we know people are anxious. We, we have like a 30 minute training, and then we have like that 10 minute training we do in the corner with you, you know. Mm -hmm. So we try to make it good enough where it's detailed enough so you know how to use it but also that uh, we can give it to you. So I have not heard that, but 
it is right now. We just bought twenty thousand dollars worth ourselves, so we're giving it out to our clients. And like I said, the health department has been doing it. I haven't so. heard about this in Virginia, but I have read other places that it's becoming a street commodity. We haven't heard it here. Black market. Gone up and down. Yeah, a black market. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With the concept that, okay, if I OD, one of my friends are going right. yeah, to mm -hmm. give me an archon, mm -hmm. which is kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, great job. I've, I've seen your work for many years, and um, part of the training that we do with Delta Sigma Theta is to get people trained too. Um, a lot of us that signed up to try to get into the revive training and couldn't get on there. So <laughs> is there a waiting list uh, for people who are interested to get into the revive training? We can actually do special training like if, if uh, a sorority fraternity or any organization would like for us to come to there and do it, we could do that. Mm -hmm. And we can make a special time, whatever's convenient. We do weekends, we do evenings, so we're not restricted. Right. So if a church or any, we can, we're, we want to do it. Right. So, and now that we have purchased the Narcan, we got plenty of money also to buy additional if, we, if needed. Um, because some of it can cost, Narcan can cost like $35 or $40 for each, right. each piece. So we know it's expensive for people to have. Right. So that's why we're giving it out. But once you have the training, once you use it, you want to come back, you get some more. But definitely anybody that, uh, any organization can, uh, we're definitely come, like I said, weekends, evenings, we don't care. We want the word out there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Appreciate it. Your wish. Uh, Dr. Back. Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, mm -hmm. members of council, you have nine city manager reports uh, on your docket for tonight, and I will go through uh, them uh, with, with you. Uh, you have the, as you heard tonight, the 2020 Assistance to Firefighter Grant AFG. I think that the chief has explained that. I don't have to read that detail. That is on your docket, the $630,000. The next is the 2020 Virginia SOR Year 2 Treatment and Recovery Funding. That is a part of Mrs. Braithwaite's um, presentation today. It's an adoption of an ordinance accepting an OPR treatment and recovery grant in the amount of $400,000 from the Virginia Department of Behavior, Health, and Development Services. The next is the General Fund FY 2020 Budget Appropriation for One-Time Retiree Supplement. It's an adoption of an ordinance authorizing the appropriation of $646,200 from the General Fund fund balance for the non-departmental benefits retiree supplement line item in the FY 2020 General Fund budget for the purpose of funding a one-time supplement in the gross amount of $600 to beneficiaries under the Portsmouth Supplemental Retirement System and the Fire and Police Retirement System. Them. I would like to note that this amount is $600, but it will vary based on the, the salaries and the tax schedule for each of those who are impacted. The next is the adoption of, of, of amending the city code to limit retirement adjustments for supplements unless the system are funded at 80% of the actuary accrued liability. Adoption of an ordinance to amend the and reordain Article 2 and Article 3 of Chapter 30 of the Code of the City of Portsmouth, Virginia, 2006, by amending Section 30-122 and Section 30-243 for the purpose of conditioning the adjustment of retiree allowances and the payment of supplements under the Portsmouth Supplemental Retirement System and the Portsmouth Fire and Police Supplement System. The next is the selective enforcement alcohol, and there are three uh, items that are coming uh, through the uh, police department, Chief Angela Green. These monies will be used um, to enable the police department to provide overtime payments for conducting checkpoints, problem area saturation patrols, DMV approval training, and purchasing associated equipment. The first is an ordinance accepting a grant for $39,186 from the U.S. Department of Transportation National Highway Traffic Safety Administration um, and the Wash Virginia Highway Safety Office and appropriating said funds to the 2020 uh, grant fund. The next, which is under the same um, 
order of supporting um, the overtime is an adoption of an ordinance accepting a grant in the amount of $6,958 from the U.S. Department of Transportation National Highway Traffic Safety Administration through the Virginia Highway Safety Office and appropriating the said amount in the 2020 grant. The last is the Selective Enforcement Speeding DMV FY 2020. And it's adoption of an ordinance accepting a grant in $21,234 for the same organization, and we'll go further say it. The last two are coming through uh, the city engineer, James E. Wright, and they are revenue sharing applications that are going to be submitted. The first is for the Twin Pines Road Widening Project and the Hopla Creek Parkway Active Transportation Improvement Projects. And this is a, will be an adoption of a resolution that will go with the application supporting the City of Portsmouth FY 2021 Revenue Sharing Application to the Virginia Department of Transportation. And as I indicated in the discussion, it's the Twin Pine Roads Widening Project increases the pavement width for the roadway segment between Swannanoa Road and Sunset Lane. And the project includes drainage and utility improvements, stormwater management, and the shared use path for pedestrians and bicycles. It provides for additional safety and accessibility for all modal users in the quarter. And the Hoffler Creek Parkway Active Transportation Improvement Projects add a shared use path, bus shelter, and other amenities for pedestrians and bicycle use in the median on the Hoffler Creek Parkway. Before you go yes. off on that one, does that include the pathway that uh, was presented? Presented to council uh, about six or seven months ago. Yes, sir. It that does, does okay. include that. Yeah. And I, I would like to underscore that this is your resolution that will go with the application. This is a part of the 2021 funding package. So, uh, as I said in our meeting this morning, that we'll let the citizens know that we are moving forward. This is now in the stage of application that will be going before the state. And um, our success with these kinds of fundings have been very, very good. The last one is adoption, which is tied into this one, adoption of a resolution supporting the City of Portsmouth FY 2021 Transportation Alternative Set-Aside Surface Transportation Block Grant Funding Applications to the Virginia Department of Transportation. And this is the complete High Street Phase 1 project. It's a gateway project that creates a pedestrian and bicycle-friendly quarter between Chestnut and Primrose Streets. Those concludes the city. While we're on the agenda, program. we have special presentations. Uh, we're uh, continuing our recognition of foster mm -hmm. uh, care families. We have the proclamation for Manufacturing Day, and Madam Clerk will read the proclamation. And I assume that uh, Mr. Moore uh, will join me. Yes, I, okay. he's going to be with his staff. Mm -hmm. And then at the third presentation is a special presentation to Ron Peterson, who is the owner operator of Chick fil A. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have heard that um, he's being moved to start the first ever Chick-fil-A in, in Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. Mm -hmm. And so he's been very much part of our community, mm -hmm. um, very involved um, giving food, not mm -hmm. selling food, mm -hmm. where, where it was appropriate. We're going to tease him a little bit. His task in Las Vegas will be to advertise Portsmouth. <laughs> okay, with that, let's go to City Council liaison reports, and we'll start with Shannon. Okay, Mayor. A couple of things before I get into the liaison report. Um, I wanted to... Can we do liaison reports first and then come back? Absolutely. Okay. Sure. Um, so, first of all, the retirement board, we had our meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, the presentation was given by our financial advisor, Mr. Birnbaum, and you know, just to let you know, I think the overall outlook is positive. However, th there may be some things looming in terms of the economy, so we want to stay vigilant and prudent in our investments, and overall, I think we're in good hands. Um, that's what we were left with. Um, the TCC board, we will be welcoming our new board member on Friday, uh, this Friday, the 27th, uh, with Dr. Michelle Woodhouse, uh, uh, retired Admiral Mark Hugel. The mayor and I will be uh, introducing him to the TCC board. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, um, Coastal Redevelopment Housing Authority uh, met on the September 19th. Um, it was their annual meeting, so they had the election of officers. Um, new chair uh, elected, um, well, same chair, Davy Smith was re-elected um, as chair. And new vice chair is uh, Bruce Lalande. Um, there was a split vote, 4-3. Uh, um, they, of course, um, had a lengthy discussion about the FOIA uh, information that was referenced by General Counsel Karen um, James, um, some reference between the Virginia State Code, and that was in reference to the council liaison, uh, myself, uh, being in attendance at the closed session meetings. Um, there was also some discussion about a check that was issued um, without a check number. So um, one commissioner felt that their system could be Compromise if you could issue a check without a check number, but that was corrected and um, anyway, it was uh, passed on. Um, they passed the resolution um, speaking to Lexington Place, um, phase one. Um, their total development costs for 72 rental units, um, $18,244,000, um, $338,000 of which they used CIP funds that came from the city. Um, they will be joining us, of course, um, at their next meeting um, um, here on um, our next city council meeting. Thank you. Nothing right. Paul, uh, the um, Military Affairs Commission uh, uh, had an uneventful meeting last month. We meet again tomorrow, but in the interim, last week, um, uh, I and um, Herb Lindley, who's the chairman of the commission, and I hosted all of the command master chiefs from our uh, different commands in the city uh, for lunch together uh, at Roger Brown's, which was really nice. It's the first time we've ever tried this, but it's the first time in about 10 years that we've had all new CMCs for every single command in the city. So we had nine chiefs uh, for lunch. Uh, it was interesting to see that a few knew each other from former places. And I think the most important thing I learned um, from the Command Master Chief for the Atlantic uh, Area Coast Guard is that 17% of the Coast Guard is female. Mm -hmm. And of those 17% females in the Coast Guard, 40% live in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. uh, and Portsmouth, Virginia and Alameda, California are the only two places in America that the Coast Guard can co-locate married Coasties. So um, the female coasties are very important to Portsmouth, and I don't think I'd ever had that concept. That's a wonderful statistic to know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, PPIC and EDA met together um, a week ago. Um, that was a great meeting to have all those folks together. A um, lot, of, lot of good discussion, and uh, of course, Manufacturing Day came out of that that you'll be mm -hmm. presenting tonight. Uh, the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, what's referred to as the TPO, had a joint meeting with the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission, which is called HRTAC. And a presentation was given to the joint uh, uh, meeting by the Virginia Department of Transportation on their analysis of what's called hot lanes. Those are high occupancy toll lanes. And the concern is, is that uh, the money, which is not a small amount of money, the $5.3 billion that's being spent on highway improvements financed through HR TAC, um, the requirement of the law, uh, state law, is that it relieve congestion. And the concern is, is that you don't want to build these new facilities and find that they don't work at the minute that you cut the ribbon. And so VDOT is doing an analysis of the possibility of hot lanes starting, I'm going to say, roughly where um, Mercury Boulevard is, uh, coming east through the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, uh, coming east on 64, past the airport, down to the intersection with 264, coming around to the high-rise bridge and ending at um, at Bowers Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, the analysis, uh, I think that you would probably agree, needs to be completed and go all the way up 664 and back to Hampton. 
otherwise you don't have a network. Uh, but the TPO is creating a, a committee to look at uh, the analysis and to work with VDOT. Uh, it's still a study, but it's a scary study. Mm -hmm. um, so that's and that involves tolls. That mm -hmm. involves tolls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, any discussion on what the toll amounts would no. be at this point? No, it doesn't. And it'll probably be a variable toll is what what they're looking at. That it, much like the hot lanes that are in use now, where uh, you're told. Uh, given the uh, load that the hot lanes are, are carrying. But it would be if you have a, a certain threshold in your car, you're not told. So, for example, if you had four people, then you're not told, you can drive toll free. That's the current notion. And I can tell you that uh, toll is an ugly word. Yeah, it sure it is. is. Yeah. 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 Right. It's a four-letter word. It's right? a four-letter yeah. word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with that, I've got, with council's consensus, I've got a couple of things that I'd like to ask the city manager. Um, one is the 300 block of London. We've got parking meters on that block uh, on the south side of the street and on the north side of the street. We have residents. Um, a part of that block um, on the south side is Court Street Academy. And the nearby blocks of London are, don't have meters. And um, parking is controlled by permit. Mm -hmm. And so we have residents who are getting tickets. And they're not um, cheap tickets. They're $25 okay. to get a ticket just to park in front of your house. And so with council's uh, concurrence, I'd like to ask the city manager to look at the feasibility of removing um, the parking meters on that block of London, make it like the rest. The alternate parking is Middle Street Garage, mm -hmm. which is underutilized. We want to encourage people there and to control parking by permit. Everybody agree with that? That's also something I can bring up at the parking authority at our next meeting. Yeah, okay, yeah. that would be good. And then I have I got a complaint today uh, from one of the nearby property owners on Washington Street uh, on the demolition of the new St. Mark abandoned church at 609 that the contractor. Say that again, Mayor. The, the Gothic looking church that the city Saint bought, Mark. St. Mark's, that is subject for, to demolition. Uh, apparently the contractor is being rude to the adjacent property owners and they need to cooperate. Same church, different inquiry, which was what's going to happen to the stained glass? Mm -hmm. Can they be salvaged? And so yeah. if you would put those. Now I think. You got one and you got yeah. one? Yeah. But and, uh, I've actually got two. The first one is I had a call from a uh, residential contractor today. Uh, he was concerned that uh, when he went to uh, get a building permit, uh, he was told uh, there was a new policy where he was going to have to get a soil analysis before he dug the footings, which. Uh, he was concerned uh, that the additional cost, also additional time uh, that it would take. He also said that uh, we would be the only city in Hampton Roads to require uh, soil analysis on residential construction. I didn't have a chance to call all the cities. I did call Chesapeake, and uh, they don't require such things. So if it's a uh, Consensus. I would like uh, the management to look into that and uh, get back to council. Yes. Are we okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your, your second item. The, the other item was one of the agenda items, and that's 19-351. Mm -hmm. I know at our last meeting uh, uh, when we were discussing about the $600 uh, stipend, uh, it was mentioned that we need to tackle the, uh, the problem with uh, uh, the funding uh, for the retirement system. 
And what we didn't have at that meeting was the uh, uh, language and, and the facts. So I would like to see us uh, table that uh, so we can have a discussion on the language in it, and more importantly, that uh, the people affected by it will have a time to uh, digest it and uh, weigh in on it as well. What is the pleasure? You may against tabling it. Uh, I agree. Okay. Now remember, a, a motion to table has no discussion. Yeah. So when this comes up, if you'll, uh, I'll entertain a motion. If it's the table, we get a second. We'll go to the vote. All right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Right. right. I do have a question. Can, can I ask a question? Y yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure it's not a discussion. No, no, you have question. the floor. So, so um, item 1950, it looks like that m might coincide or go along with 19351. So if we table that one, should we then table both of them? I'm they do coincide. Yes. Yeah, that's, Which, yeah, that was it's all good. related. I, I'm ready to vote on 50. I mean, I thought that was going to go through. Yeah. I thought they were companions. You know, I felt one was because of the other in the future. So, so what is the? How did they get together? Because we asked them to put oh, them together. Excuse me. <laughs> All right. So, what do what do you? What's the consensus of the council? Table both. Well, I was ready to pass 350. I just was wondering if 350 I don't see where passed. they connected uh, yeah. in that uh, respect. I don't think they have to. Yeah. 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 I think, I think they that's what stand I thought. alone. Yeah, yes. I, I think yeah. they're stand alone. I'm okay. fair with that. Okay, yes. yeah. good. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Um, getting back to the parking, um, we have kind of a double standard. When we approve the new current uh, apartments above Jimmy John's, mm -hmm. we didn't require any off-street parking. And those residents now are parking in the unmetered space on High Street. So we kind of get a, a double standard there. And it may be something that we want to contemplate as we look to our new zoning ordinance. So with that, I think we've finished. Well, well I had, I had yeah. one. Oh, you have one more? Yes, the, the one that we were talking about. Well, so um, I, I have some concerns, and my concerns are centered around our, our health care provider here in the city, Bon Secours. I know that they recently ended their services at the birthing center. And, and you know, in light of what's happening with health care and, and the situation we are in with one single health care provider in terms of hospital in our city, I think it would be a good idea to ask the leaders of Bon Secours to come before this council and explain to us what their future is going to be here in the city and, and their, some of their game plan for the future. And, and I preface that because I've talked to several folks, uh, doctors and, and individuals over there, executives, they've had a high turnover. I don't know if everyone is aware that the individual, the, the physician who ran the heart center over there has left. Um, he's no longer there. Um, who, 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 and he was a very good doctor. So I just want to make sure that we understand as a council uh, what, what we're faced with in terms of Bon Secours' commitment to providing health care in our community. It's interesting that you bring it up because I had said that to a retired nurse this afternoon that I shudder to think of the day that we read that Bon Secours uh, closes or shrinks in size. Mm -hmm. And to your point, um, I asked Tom Prevett mm -hmm. uh, that ask um, the CEO, which is in Richmond, to come to the city. So instead of I asked the same thing at the Chamber of Commerce event yeah. that we were at. Yeah. So we all are we all are we're all on the same, the same page. Yeah. yeah, and I spoke to him too, Tom yeah. Prevett, and okay. he he mentioned that I mean they were only getting two births a month and they could not sustain that. <coughs> Well, I saw him on Sunday, not that, you know, when's the last time you saw Tom, but right. I, I saw Tom at an event on Sunday, and so I will make this a public meeting, let's mm -hmm. have them in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is a lot of anecdotal uh, information flying around, and mm -hmm. we, we need to hear it from the source. Right. Mm -hmm. all, the suggestion. all the expansions and moves are going to Harborview, yeah. and since they were bought out, the parent company now is larger than them, so they're not local to us. Good point. 
All right, we have a need for a closed session. Is there a motion? I move to go into a closed meeting, A, pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-37.11A3, 2, 2 for the purpose of discussing the acquisition and disposition of real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body, specifically regarding the Victory Crossing area, and B, pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A7 for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable, probable litigation where such consult consultation and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the city, specifically regarding uh, uh, Sheriff Michael A. Moore versus City of Portsmouth, uh, CL 19003403 and CL 19003277, and C, pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A1 for the purpose of discussing and considering prospective candidates for and appointees to boards and commissions. Second. Sure, second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? This will be a roll call oral vote. And now, Clerk, will you call the roll? Yes, vote. sir. Mr. Battle? Yes. Mr. Clark? Yes. Mr. Glover? Yes. Mrs. Lucas Berg? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Ms. Simmons? Yes. Mayor Ruff? Yes. We're in closed session. And 